Hello, today is the day we talk about the immune system, that thing that's been keeping you alive for all these years. So we're going to be talking about the functions of the immune system, how it recognizes what is foreign and what is native, and how the innate and adaptive branches of this immune system are different. We're going to talk about how the body remembers an infection, and some instances of what happens when the immune system malfunctions. So I want to start off by telling you about my favorite island, which is North Sentinel Island, and it is located out here in the Indian Ocean, right where this star is, and this island is just incredible because it's home to a civilization called the North Sentinelese. They are one of the last remaining uncontacted peoples, and that means they're living in complete isolation from the rest of humanity. As far as we know, they're a hunter and gatherer civilization. They do not know how to make fire, and we know very little about their way of life or even how many there are. There's this huge mystery. In fact, this is the best picture we have of the North Sentinelese people. The Indian government, who technically owns these waters, could go in there with you know helicopters and ships and find out what's going on, but scientists have recommended against this. And the one big reason is that scientists fear that they have a lack of immunity. You see, our bodies all carry thousands of different bacteria and viruses that we are immune to. Your body knows how to defend against these invaders and so the pathogens, they don't hurt you. But the Sentinelese people, they have lived isolated from the rest of the world for so long that scientists, they fear that these people have never encountered, say, the virus that we know as a common cold, and they would have no immunity to it. So instead of just getting sick and then getting better, that it would be devastating and wipe out their entire population. So, as we begin talking about the immune system, I want you to imagine your body as a castle, and your immune system needs to help defend that castle. We've got a moat around the castle for with water in it, we've got walls of the castle. The first branch of the immune system we'll look at is the innate immune system. We would call this an all-purpose kind of defense against all kinds of pathogens, whether it's foreign proteins, viruses, bacteria, parasites, or fungi. It is the fastest rapid response to an infection, but it's not specific. It's all-purpose. It does the same thing to pretty much any pathogen. Our skin and mucous membranes are the foremost example of this. Our skin is impenetrable as long as it doesn't get cut. And we have mucous membranes that line our airways, our digestive and urinary tracts. And they're secreting these secretions that help to trap pathogens that are trying to invade our bodies and also to wipe, uh, whisk them away. Our skin, interestingly, has a low pH, so the acidity prevents a lot of harmful bacteria from being able to grow on our skin. As well, our skin is home to many normal fauna, which are friendly bacteria that don't harm us, and they kind of crowd out the harmful bacteria so that there's not enough food and resources for the harmful bacteria to really survive in large numbers on our skin. So we would compare the skin and mucous membranes, these physical barriers, to the castle walls. They're physically there preventing pathogens from entering. Another part of our innate immune system is the phagocytes. These are white blood cells that ingest foreign particles. When there is an infection in some part of our body, the neutrophils are the first cells to arrive to the scene, and they are a short-lived response. They'll get there, ingest some foreign particles, and then their response will be short-lived. Later arriving will be the macrophages, which have a longer-lived response, and they're more effective, but they get there later. Here we have a macrophage engulfing, undergoing phagocytosis for these microbes. That could be a bacteria right there. The macrophage will encapsulate the microbes into a vacuole. Lysosomes containing enzymes will destroy the foreign pathogens, and then the remnants will be extruded. Now, the key thing here is that these cells both are a form of nonspecific immunity. They do the same for any foreign invader. They don't specialize against a specific one. Just anything that's not the body's own cells, they will attack. And this comes up when people have heart transplants. If you receive a heart transplant, then your rest of your body will see that new heart as something foreign. And 
a person who receives such a transplant will need to take drugs to suppress their immune system for as long as they live to prevent their body from attacking their new heart that's keeping them alive. And another cell in our innate immune system is the natural killer cell. This is a cell which destroys our native body cells that have been infected by a virus. So on the left here we've got a natural killer cell that's checking out a normal cell. This cell has not been infected by a virus. And because of this interaction with the MHC class 1, that stands for major histocompatibility, because of this successful interaction, the natural killer cell leaves that cell alone. But here on the right, the natural killer cell has encountered an abnormal cell. It's infected by a virus, and the natural killer cell knows this because it's not expressing MHC class 1. When this interaction happens, the natural killer cell will release factors causing this virally infected body cell to undergo apoptosis. It's going to release porphyrin, which creates holes called pores in the cell, and it's going to release granzyme, which is a protease that destroys the cell's proteins, thus killing the virally infected cell, preventing that virus from being able to reproduce and spread to neighboring cells. Here's kind of a holistic picture of what happens at the site of infection. So there's been a foreign pathogen that's entered the body in some way. The cells that have been invaded, as well as mast cells, mast cells in the surrounding area, will both release a substance called histamine. And this is a molecule that's known as an inflammatory molecule. The effects of inflammation are going to be causing this capillary, this blood vessel, to dilate. And that's going to allow white blood cells to move from the blood into the tissue where they are needed to fight the infection. As we said before, neutrophils arrive first and they start eating or phagocytosing the foreign pathogens. And then macrophages will arrive later doing the same thing for a longer lived response. Inflammation is characterized by heat in the site of infection, swelling because of all the fluid rushing into the tissue, pain transmitted through the nerves and redness due to the dilation of the capillaries. Um, what's interesting is that an allergic reaction is actually a version of inflammation that happens when it shouldn't. An allergic reaction is when the body responds to an innocuous molecule, so something that's not really harmful, such as peanut oil. So with someone with a peanut allergy, their immune system is hypersensitive and it reacts as though this is a dangerous infection, when in fact it's not something that's going to hurt the body. These histamines are the original causes of inflammation at the site. And so when someone has allergies, you may hear about them taking an antihistamine as a treatment or prevention for those allergies. The last part of innate immunity that I want you to know about is the complement system. This is a set of proteins which when triggered will assemble together and form this pore on the surface of the pathogen. Let's say this is a bacteria, a foreign bacteria. They form this pore called a membrane attack complex. And I just love that name, membrane attack complex. This pore is going to allow water and ions to rush into the cell and the cell will swell, undergo lysis, and be completely destroyed. So essentially we poke holes in our enemies. If we put this all together, I want you to think of the castle as our body again. The skin is like the castle walls, that's our innate immune barrier. The secretions that our mucous membranes secrete to wash away the pathogens, that's like the water in the moat. We've got phagocytes, which I've put as crocodiles that are swimming around in the moat, and they are ready to just eat whatever foreign invaders come in. And we have complement proteins, which poke holes in our invading bacteria, so I've drawn them as spikes on the ground outside the castle. All of these defenses are good, and they're effective, but I want you to remember that they are non-specific. They target every foreign invader in the same way. They're not specialized toward any particular pathogen. That's it for innate immune system. Join me in the next video as we talk about the adaptive immune system. Hi, so we just got done talking about the innate immune system. Now we're going to go on to the other branch, the adaptive immune system. 
And if your body's a castle, I want you to think of the adaptive immune system as the actual people there, they're manning the castle, the guards, all the staff that are on hand. Our adaptive immune system is slower than the innate, but it is highly specific toward a particular pathogen. Sometimes it's also called the acquired immunity, and the key feature is that this system can remember past infections. So on this graph, if we've got on the y-axis number of antibodies being made, we can use this as a measure of how strong or how robust the body is at reacting to a particular pathogen. In this case, it's called an antigen. At the first exposure, first time your body is exposed to this antigen, it creates some antibodies slowly and then as the disease is fought off and you recover, the number of antibodies goes down. However, the adaptive immune system remembers this antigen and when that same one comes in your body a second time, the response is now not only far greater, more antibodies are made, but also the slope of this line is steeper. So it's making more antibodies faster than it was the first time. This difference between primary response and secondary response is a hallmark of adaptive immunity. So first we're going to talk about how the adaptive immune system can be so specific. We have cells that respond specifically to every single possible pathogen we can encounter. This specificity is achieved through the antigen-antibody binding. These antigens are foreign molecules and there might be, say, a cell with a bunch of different antigens on its surface, but what's important is that the body can recognize any foreign cell or virus that invades it. Our body produces these proteins called antigen, uh, pardon me, antibodies. Our body produces antibodies which have two arms and on each arm is an antigen binding site that is specifically shaped, it's a protein that's specifically shaped to bind tightly, strongly, and specifically only to the antigen that it's made for. So in this case, the yellow antibody will only bind strongly to the yellow antigen. And your body makes antibodies that will bind to this purple one, to this red one, to this green one, all different antibodies you're capable of making. And it's this specific fit between antibody and antigen that allows our adaptive immune system to specifically attack each foreign pathogen. Antibodies can be free-floating like this one or they can be attached to the surface of a cell called a lymphocyte and in either case they're doing the same thing. These arms are binding to the antigens identifying the foreign molecules. Now what's interesting is that among antibodies we make millions of different ones and they come in several classes there's one class of antibodies called immunoglobulin A, IgA, and this class of antibodies is actually secreted through breast milk in high concentrations. So this means that when a mother is breastfeeding, she's passing down antibodies, a form of immunity, to her child. And so that's actually one of the benefits of breastfeeding. Another class of antibodies called IgG is present and can cross the placenta during gestation so in that way a mother can transfer her immunity to the fetus before it's even born. So in this diagram we've laid out the white blood cells also called leukocytes into the ones that are involved in innate immunity and over here the ones that are involved in adaptive immunity. In adaptive immunity the cells are called lymphocytes, and we divide that into T cells and B cells. Both of these lymphocytes are produced, they are initially born in the bone marrow. B cells, they will stay in the bone marrow and mature there. Here, this bone marrow is producing a B cell to detect every possible antigen that may be encountered. So that's what I mean by the B-cell maturing. They're maturing to be specific toward every antigen that can be encountered. The T-cells, however, they will start in the bone marrow and they will move into the thymus, which is this organ that we have down our chest here. 
and they mature in the thymus. As well, the T cells are maturing in order to recognize a specific pathogen. When these cells are mature, they're going to be released into both the blood and the lymph. We all know about the blood circulation, and the lymph circulation is another transport network throughout our body that works more in getting rid of the unwanted materials of the body, whereas the blood also works in delivering materials that we do want, like delivering glucose and oxygen to all the parts of our body. Since lymphocytes are made in the bone marrow, people who have lymphoma, which is a type of cancer of the bone marrow, they can receive a treatment in the form of a bone marrow transplant. And when this is done, you just have to be very careful to make sure that the person donating the bone marrow is a match in terms of the types of receptors that are displayed on their cells so that the bone marrow will be a match and the body won't try to destroy its own cells. So you may be wondering, how exactly can our body produce millions of different antibodies, one for each possible antigen that we might encounter? How do we possibly have enough space in our DNA to do that? Well, that is done through a process called recombination, and sometimes it's called VDJ recombination. Atop here, we're starting with the DNA of an undifferentiated B cell. So this is a B cell that hasn't yet gone through the maturation steps in order to be specific toward a particular antigen. Because remember, in the end, the B cell is going to have what's called here as a B cell receptor, but we can just call this an antibody on its surface. And so it's got these little Y shapes on its surface that are going around trying to recognize what is a foreign antigen. So we start with the DNA that's undifferentiated. There are several V segments, V for variable, some J segments, and C segments. The C segment is constant, so there's only one of those. Every antibody has the same C segment, which is this dark one down here. And the J segments join together, the constant and the variable regions. The variable regions, as you might expect, are the ones here. They need to change shape in order to bind to only their specific antigen. During maturation, the B cell will differentiate, and some parts of this DNA are going to be spliced out. Here in this one, all but three of the V segments have been spliced out, and one J segment is left over. Now, I want to point out that this is not like mRNA splicing that you've learned about recently. This is different because it's happening in the DNA. Once these V segments get chopped out, they are gone forever in this B cell. In this case, they've kept V1, V2, and V3, but in another B cell, they may keep V11 and V12 and V13. So every B cell is going to be different. Once the B cell is mature, transcription can occur producing the pre-mRNA, that's what we call it before it undergoes splicing, and then the mRNA once it's undergone splicing. The final mRNA should contain only one V, one J, and one C. So we've gone from many possible segments down to just one. If you consider that every B cell can undergo a different, slightly different combination of sections spliced out, you can see how the B cells can all end up with a slightly different specificity, different antibodies on the surface, and being able to, rep to recognize different antigens in the body. So we're going to talk about the B cells first. And in our castle story, these are the castle guards. They are constantly patrolling on guard. They circulate the blood and the lymph on guard for an antigen. We say that they are a part of humoral immunity because the humors are an old word for the fluid of the body. So the humors include the blood, the lymph, the extracellular fluid, basically everything that's not inside a cell. The B cells are going to roam around the blood and the lymph, and they have those Y-shaped antibodies on the surface. Each B cell recognizes only its specific antigen. When a B cell finds its antigen, it's going to activate. And an activated B cell does two things. It undergoes 
a lot of mitosis. We call this clonal expansion, producing a lot more B cells. But it's the B cells it produces aren't going to be the same. Some will be plasma B cells, some will be memory B cells. So there's differentiation here. Here's our initial B cell, and it's been roaming around the body, and it detected an antigen, which bound to its antibody. When the B cell is activated, it does clonal expansion. Some of the cells that it divides into will be plasma B cells, and these are short-lived. They don't last for a long time, but while they are around, they just pump out hundreds and hundreds of free antibodies. And the value of this is that the free antibodies are going to be flowing around everywhere. They're going to be able to attach to whatever was producing the antigen, the foreign material in the cell, and they're going to cover it up. Say if it's a bacteria, they're going to cover up the surface of the bacteria with all these free antibodies. And this will prevent the bacteria from undergoing its functions. Another good thing about having a lot of antibodies is that when a bacteria or another pathogen is covered in antibodies, this speeds up the speed at which it gets phagocytosed or eaten by the phagocytes. Plasma B cells only last long enough to fight the initial infection and then they die off. However, another class of B cells was produced called memory B cells and they are long lived. They are going to stay around in the cell even after this initial infection is over. And they're going to be around even when that same antigen happens to enter the body again. And this is important because when that same antigen enters the body again, now say it, there are a lot more B cells around to fight that infection. Say for the first exposure, there was only one B cell that responded to that antigen. At the next exposure, there are four because of these memory B cells that are long lived. Now I'm not saying that it's actually one becoming four, but the number of B cells multiplies and so the body is much better able to respond to the second infection. Here's a graph showing this. Here's the first antigen exposure. So the first time your body encounters this antigen, it produces some antibodies, but it's kind of slow and it doesn't make as many in total because there were not that many B cells around to respond. We produce plasma B cells, which secrete the antibodies and then die. And we produce memory B cells, which stay around long after. The body's exposed to the antigen again. This could be a year, 10 years down the road. And now, because these memory B cells that were made are still around, they're long lived, the antibodies are produced at a faster rate and a higher maximum number of antibodies produced. The secondary immune response is always much stronger than the primary immune response because of those memory B cells. Now this is an important one. This diagram, primary versus secondary immune response, highly likely to come up on an AP exam as far as we know. So this is the one that you should remember. Uh, join me in the next video when we look at T cells and their function in the adaptive immune system. We just got done talking about the B cells, or the B lymphocytes, and how they have antibodies on the surface that recognize an antigen that's floating around. But you might have thought, what happens if the antigen, the uh, dangerous antigen, is not just floating around in the fluid? What happens if it's inside one of our own cells, for example, a virus? In that case, the B cell can't do anything. B cells only work in humoral immunity in the fluid. We need another kind of immune cell to take care of antigens that have gotten inside our own cells. And that is the T cell. The first kind of T cell we're going to look at is the killer T cell. And if your body is a castle, this is the executioner. It's also called a cytotoxic T cell. And the role of the cell is to identify and kill all the native cells that have been infected by a virus. So this cell needs some way of knowing, some way of detecting which of the body cells are healthy and which have been infected by a virus and need to be killed for the, for the sake of the rest of the body. When a cell is infected by a virus, the virus inserts its genetic information, be it DNA or RNA, into the host cell. 
and uses the host cell's machinery to make these abnormal peptides. They're abnormal because they are not typical to be found in our bodies. And the cell, what it does is it puts these abnormal peptides through the endoplasmic reticulum and inserts them in this little display protein called a MHC class 1. It shuttles these two through the Golgi into a vesicle and ultim ultimately back to the surface of the cell. So that U shape is the MHC class 1 and the viral antigen, the one that came from the virus, is in red. This cell is showing, it's showing everyone around it, hey, this is what's inside me. It's showing there's a viral antigen inside me. It's like a cry for help. And the killer T cell is the one that's going to respond to that cry for help. When the killer T cell, or here it's called cytotoxic, when it recognizes that antigen, which is in uh, orange, displayed on MHC class 1, the cytotoxic T cell will activate. Now important to note that this particular killer T cell will only detect this triangle orange antigen. There are other killer T cells to detect all the other kinds of antigens there could be, but this one is specific to this antigen. When a killer T cell becomes activated, that means it has recognized, okay, this is a, a human cell, our cell, but it's been infected by a virus. It will release factors to induce cell death in the infected cell. So this is essentially saying, okay, I know you're one of our own body's cells, but you're infected by a virus. I'm really sorry. We have to destroy you so that the virus is not allowed to replicate. So it releases these factors, causing destruction of the infected cell. The job of the executioner is not easy. There's another kind of T cell that I've saved for last because it's the helper T cell, and it's essentially the supervisor of all the other ones. So if the B cells were the guards, the killer T cells were the executioners, the helper T cell is supervising all of them. Its role is to check on all the other immune cells and check whether they've identified their antigens correctly and if they have done that correctly, then the helper T cell will instruct that other immune cell on how to respond. So the helper T cell is always interacting with a different immune cell. Here it's labeled as an antigen presenting cell because remember that cells can, if they have encountered an antigen, they can display it on their surface showing, hey, here's what I found. And essentially these cells are going Hey, to their supervisor, hey, this is what I found. Is it right? Am I right that this is an antigen that should be responded to? This interaction between various membrane receptors is what mediates the job of the helper T cell. We have an interaction between CD4 on the helper T cell and MHC class 2 on the antigen presenting cell. These interactions are going to trigger the release of factors from the helper T cell as well as from the antigen presenting cell. Signals that are essentially confirming, yes, we've found an antigen correctly and we need to take action. So I know all along I've been saying like that each of these cells activates, but most immune cells, they will not activate unless they are told by a helper T cell to activate. So let's take our first example which is the killer T cell. This is what I showed you before. The killer T cell will release factors telling the virally infected cell to destroy itself. It needs a signal from a helper T cell in order to proceed with that. It needs the thumbs up from its supervisor before it does that. And what I mean by thumbs up is the release of factors from the helper T cell to the, to the killer T cell saying, yep, you got it right, go ahead and release your factors. A T helper cell will also help a B cell. Here we have a B cell, remember those involved in humoral immunity, and it has detected these blue square antigens. A B cell will also internalize some of these blue square antigens and display them on its surface as if to say, hey, this is what I found telling its supervisor, hey, this is what I found. Should I really react to this? And when it displays it, 
the helper T cell that is specific to this antigen will perform this receptor interaction and the helper T cell will release factors telling the B cell yes go ahead and activate when the B cell activates it will make many plasma B cells to create antibodies as well as memory B cells that are not shown unfortunately the helper T cell also mediates the actions of macrophages so these macrophages these are the ones involved in innate immunity they'll just eat any foreign cell they're not specific but a helper T cell when it activates a macrophage will speed up the actions of a macrophage it will make the macrophage perform phagocytosis more efficiently. So in summation, the adaptive immune system, we can think of it as two branches, the humoral immunity, which is taking care of pathogens in the fluids of the cell, and that's taken care of by the B cells. And then the cell-mediated immunity, which is done by T cells, cytotoxic or killer T cells, which destroy cells that have been infected by a virus, and the helper T cells, which are like the supervisor. They confirm and they mediate the actions of the other immune cells based on their detection of that specific antigen. So here we go back to this primary and secondary immune response graph. On the y-axis is our antibody concentration, and that's our measure of how well the body is responding to the infection. There's antigen A, and so that's a specific disease. Say you're exposed to antigen A for the first time. Your body will produce some antibodies to fight off this infection, but it will produce them slowly, and the maximum amount it produces is not very high. That's because there are no memory B cells yet. T cells also produce a memory versions of themselves when activated, so that's why this says no memory cells. There are no memory B cells or memory T cells. So essentially the cell has the, the body has very few cells around that will be able to respond to this particular antigen. Some time passes and the person is exposed to antigen A again, and then the second disease, antigen B. And what happens is that its response to antigen A is to make, very quickly, a lot of antibodies against this antigen. And for antigen B, since it's the first time it's been encountered, it still produces that slow and not very large response to antigen B. The key here is that the second exposure always elicits a stronger, greater, and faster immune response than the first exposure because at the time of the second exposure there are memory B cells and memory T cells, more of them than before, that are ready to respond by producing antibodies and releasing the factors that are necessary to fight off the infection. Our knowledge about the adaptive immune system has helped us to develop vaccines and eventually eradicated certain diseases in the world. A vaccine consists of small chopped up pieces or inactivated pieces of a molecule that would otherwise cause disease. For example, the influenza vaccine consists of small inactivated pieces of the influenza virus. When that is injected into a person, the pieces don't cause any symptoms of the disease, but they do look enough like the original disease that they elicit an immune response. They are bound to by antibodies, and the B cells that are specific to this antigen are activated. Those B cells will produce memory B cells of the same kind. And that is important because the memory B cells will stick around for a long time. Down the line, when this person gets infected with the actual disease, the one that will cause symptoms and perhaps very dangerous, this person has memory B cells because they were exposed to the vaccine. The memory B cells, there will be lots of them and they will readily produce antibodies 
quickly and a large amount of antibodies in order to cover up these antigens and have them all phagocytosed, destroyed, and the body will successfully fight off this disease. Whereas somebody who hadn't been vaccinated, they would not have the memory B cells, they wouldn't produce enough antibodies fast enough, and their body would not be able to fight off the disease as effectively. Now, to finish off, I want to talk about a couple of cases where the immune system malfunctions and what kind of conditions that causes. David Vetter was a boy known as the boy in the bubble. He had a severe combined immunodeficiency, which meant that his T and B cells were both defective. They were not able to recognize the antigens that they should have recognized. When he was born, he had to be placed in a sterile plastic bubble, and he only ever interacted with people through this bubble and through, like, gloves sticking out of the bubble. This was because even the slightest antigen that he was exposed to could easily kill him. He had no immune system, so the common cold would mean surely a death sentence for him. When he was 12, doctors proposed that they would give him a bone marrow transplant from his sister. T and B cells both originate in the bone marrow, so this seemed like it would be a good solution. They screened his sister, uh, her bone marrow, and they tried to remove all the bacteria and viruses that were present. They found she was a good match. Um, they did the bone marrow transplant, and unfortunately, a week later, he became very ill and died. He had, When he died, he had hundreds of small tumors in his body because his sister's bone marrow contained a single virus, an Epstein-Barr virus, that was not hurting her at all, but for him, it was deadly because he had no means of defending against it. Uh, fortunately, a couple of years after his death, the technologies improved for bone marrow transplants, and now children born with SCID don't have to live in a bubble. A much more common disease of the immune system is HIV. HIV is a virus which invades the T cells, the very cells that should be protecting your body from viruses. And people living with HIV need to get blood tests to measure their T cell count. And when their T cells are high, that means the virus is latent or dormant. It means their genes are present in the T cells, but they aren't making new copies of the virus, so the T cells are still working fine. When the T cell count is low, this indicates that the virus has begun assembling copies of itself and destroying its host cells. At this stage, the person is diagnosed with having AIDS, and due to their lack of T cells, they are immunocompromised. This means they're highly vulnerable to opportunistic infections. So when a person with AIDS dies, it's usually due to an infection like pneumonia or thrush that a healthy person would have had no trouble fighting off. So this example can teach us a lot about the nature of the immune system and the role of T-cells in adaptive immunity. Thanks for watching.